Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining ACEEE's webinar, Leveraging the Clean Power Plan to Expand Low-Income Energy Efficiency Programs and Investments. My name is Cassandra Cubes. I work on ACEEE's Clean Power Plan team, and I will be moderating today's webinar. And before we uh, get started, first, a few words on some administration. So I know I typed in the, the chat box. You should all have that on your screen already. Um, but everyone is in listen-only mode, which means in order to uh, give us your questions, please type those into the chat box. And type them in as soon as you think about them. Uh, we will go through any clarifying, quick clarifying questions uh, directly after each of our presenters speak. Um, but in general, we're going to be holding all of the substantive questions uh, to the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar. So please uh, type them in as you think of them. Also, this webinar is being recorded. And we will be sending out the link to this recording and the slides for today's uh, presentation to all those who have registered. Also, the link to uh, both of those things will be available on our Clean Power Plan webpage on ACEEE's website. So first, a little bit about ACEEE's webinar series. We recently introduced this new webinar series uh, with the purpose of exploring the opportunity for energy efficiency to be used for Clean Power Plan compliance. Each webinar in this series, with um, five in total, uh, highlights ACEEE's latest research uh, with an emphasis on best practices in energy efficiency program and policy design options. And these webinars feature presentations on our recent publications from our program staff and also from our Clean Power Plan team. So upcoming topics you can see listed here. Uh, next month, we'll be showing a webinar that has to do with opportunities in the industrial sector and then tying that back to using that for Clean Power Plan compliance. Then we'll talk about paying for Clean Power Plan compliance, financing, and how to incentivize efficiency. And then the last webinar happening in July will be People's Choice. And you'll be seeing options to choose from coming up in the next month or two. So stay tuned for that. And then also here is the link to find uh, uh, registration links to all of our upcoming webinars and the recording for each of the past webinars. So today's webinar will focus on opportunities to expand low-income programs and investments and how these programs can contribute to emission reduction. You can see our webinar speakers listed here. First we'll have Lauren Ross presenting. Lauren is the local policy manager here at ACEEE. She concentrates on the nexus of affordable housing, energy efficiency, and cities, and leads our work to expand utility programs to improve the efficiency of multifamily housing. And prior to joining ACEEE, Lauren was a fellow at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. She is working on her PhD in urban sociology at Temple University and earned a Master's of Arts in urban sociology from George Washington and a BA in political science from the University of Delaware. Today, on today's webinar, Lauren is going to be providing a snapshot of energy burdens faced by vulnerable communities across the country, and she will highlight programs and policies to increase efficiency investments in low-income communities. After Lauren, we'll be hearing from Rachel Cluett, who is a senior research analyst at ACEEE. Her work focuses on residential sector energy efficiency, including labeling and energy use disclosure, efficiency program design, and product standards and labeling. Rachel is a BPI certified building analyst and envelope professional and a certified HERS rater and came to ACEEE after two years of work conducting residential energy assessment. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources from Cornell University. And on today's webinar, Rachel is going to be highlighting the key questions and challenges around low-income programs for single-family homes. And she will offer some recommendations for how to increase the savings and reach of efficiency programming in this sector. And lastly, you see my name listed there. I'm Cassandra Cubes, research analyst focusing on environmental policy at ACEEE and a member of our Clean Power Plan team. And today I'm going to round out each of these presentations uh, with a few quick slides uh, to focus on how Rachel and Lauren's uh, presentations can serve as a guide for developing low-income programs and increasing investments 
um, in this sector and how these strategies can contribute to emission reduction targets under the Clean Power Plan. So now I'm going to turn things over to Lauren. Thanks, Cassandra, and thanks everyone for joining today's webinar. As Cassandra mentioned, today I'll be discussing the topic of energy affordability and how energy efficiency can help alleviate high energy burdens and create a more equitable distribution of energy costs. ACEEE recently re released a report on this topic. And this topic is particularly important because it describes a critical aspect of economic inequality. Certain groups pay disproportionately more, th more for their home energy bills which carries real implications for the ability of these households to afford basic necessities such as medicine, food, and child care. Our findings also indicate that these groups are living in less efficient housing, which poses significant impacts on health, like greater instances of asthma and other respiratory problems. Children and the elderly are also most vulnerable to these health impacts caused by improperly heated and cooled homes. Today I'll also be, di be discussing the landscape of policies um, to address high energy burdens. We found that energy efficiency is a low cost and low long-term solution to reducing energy burdens, and there's high potential for increasing these investments throughout these communities. We identified a list of policies to ramp up investments in energy efficiency, specifically in overburdened communities, of which I'll cover today. So I begin with the concept of energy burden, and specifically how we use this term because it's fundamental to today's discussion. We calculate energy burden as a proportion of total household income that goes towards home energy bills, which include electricity, natural gas, and other heating fuels. We excluded water and transportation from our analysis, but we recognize that these costs can, play, these costs can um, place a heavy burden uh, for families as well. Numerous factors can contribute to high household energy burdens. Factors can be related to the physical structure of a home, such as poor insulation or leaky roofs, um, the economic situation of residents, such as unemployment or a sudden economic hardship, the presence or absence of local policies and programs that support bill assistance or household energy efficiency improvements, and lastly, behavior, behavior residents in terms of energy use and awareness of energy conservation measures. All of these factors can contribute to one's energy burden. So a little bit about the report. Um, today we'll be focusing on some more of the high-level findings. The report contains tons of data on specific groups and for each of the cities included in, in this analysis. I provide a link to the report on my last slide, so be sure to check that out for more information. But I've already mentioned how we calculate energy burden um, in this house, taking um, total energy utility spending as a percentage of total gross household income. And as Cassandra mentioned, we're providing a snapshot of energy burdens in cities across the U.S. We rely on data from the U.S. Census Bureau's 2011 and 2013 American Housing Survey. And we look at 48 of the largest U.S. cities and specific households within each city. We include households that pay for their electricity and pay for their main heating fuel and that reported a positive household income. This, these are the um, inputs that allow us to calculate an energy burden. Unfortunately, this means we excluded households that pay for utilities as part of their rent. Um, the groups included in this analysis include low-income households, African-American and Latino households, low-income multifamily, and renters. We chose to define low-income as those households that earn 80% of their air, of area median income. Now, this is a flexible definition, but allows us to include both very low income, low income, and moderate income households. Um, and we also provide a breakdown of results by region. I won't get into this level of detail today, but the full report, as I mentioned, is available already online. So now we're, we're officially into the results. In this slide, we map the magnitude of energy burden for each city based on metro area average. Overall, we found that energy burden tends to be higher in cities as compared to states. Compared to states, We actually chose to focus on cities because cities have higher concentrations of poverty and minority communities. But it's important to note that rural communities also experience poverty and high energy burdens. And more research should be done to measure the extent and impacts of energy burden in rural areas. In a minute, I'll describe more of the group-specific energy burdens and how they compare to city medians. But while we're looking at this map, I also want to point out the cities with the highest median um, energy burdens, 
which are Men Memphis, Birmingham, New Orleans, Atlanta, and Propnitz. Overall, you'll see the um, concentration of the, the red and darker orange dots indicates that um, higher energy burdens for all communities were concentrated in the southeast and midwest. This table provides a deeper look at energy burden trends among groups. Um, again, the full report provides data for each group by city. These are trends um, for groups of households across all cities. Here I provide median income, housing unit size, annual utility bills, annual utility spending per square foot, and energy burden for these groups across all metro areas. According to the study, the average burden for these, I'm sorry, um, according to the study, the average urban household spends about 3.5% of their income on utilities, with many households spending a much higher percentage of their income of their income on these vital costs, and we're going to look at ex exactly how high energy burdens get in, in a little bit. But as you can see, on average, um, looking at this table, low-income households pay 7.2% of household income on utilities. This is more than three times the amount of higher-income households. And in terms of race of household, on average, African-American and white households pay similar utility bills, but African-American households experience the median energy burden 64% greater than white households. Latino households pay lower utility bills on average than African American and white households did, but they experienced a median energy burden 24% greater than white households. This table also demonstrates that energy burden is far from being an intractable problem just re related to persistent income disparity, as might be reinforced by the stark difference you can see here in income in this table. It's also related to the inefficiency of homes. We use the calculation of energy bills per square foot of housing area as our indication of household efficiency. So for example, two homes that are both 1,000 square foot may have one family paying 200 a month for, on utilities and the other paying 300. The family paying 300 a month is likely living in a less efficient home that requires more energy to keep it heated or cooled, with less efficient appliances and less efficient overall energy use. Overall, you can see here that low-income households paid $1.41 per square foot, while um, low-income households paid $1.17 per square foot. This is likely the case because low-income families tend to live in older housing stock with less efficiency, efficiency upgrades and appliances. But, but based on this analysis, we were able to determine that um, efficiency could reduce energy burden by 35% for low-income households. 45% for African-American households, and up to 68% for Latino households. They could, this uh, efficiency could also eliminate almost all of the excess energy burden for renters. All right, and as I've mentioned, um, in U.S. cities, low-income households are spending disproportionate amounts on energy bills. But I provide this graph because I think it helps really put that, that difference into perspective by showing the median low-income housing household energy burden compared here to the median household energy burden across the whole city. So the dots in blue are that for low-income households, and then the clear dots are the city median averages. So here you can see that low-income low households are paying significantly more um, for efficiency in, in every city. Um, and keep in mind that the blue dots as well as the clear dots represent medians. So a lot of households, 50% more to be exact, are paying more than the blue dots um, when looking at low-income households. And something you can't always see when you're first looking at the median. And we also found on this, along the same lines that in 17 cities, more than a third of the cities in our example, 25% of households had an energy burden greater than 14%, which is more than four times the national average. And keeping on that theme of looking at medians here and some issues with that, by simply looking at a median, we're not, it doesn't really represent the range of experiences of those who are the worst off within these groups. We can better understand this by comparing the energy burden for the household at the median, um, comparing that to the, highest, uh, to the highest quartile of energy burdens. For example, let's, let's walk through an example. The median low-income energy burden in Atlanta was 10.2%.
meaning that half of the city's low-income households experienced an energy burden greater than 10.2%. Looking at the highest energy burden quartile in Atlanta, we can see that 25% of the low-income population experienced an energy burden greater than or equal to 18.2%. This is more than three times the city median of 5%. On this slide, we have the energy burden of select groups by region, ordered from highest to lowest based on the average of the median energy burdens across all, all groups. Note that the Southeast and Midwest, as I've mentioned, have the highest overall energy burdens for the groups studied. While we cannot attribute what, with certainty the, the drivers of high energy burden with, within specific regions and cities, we know that numerous factors are at play. Using the Southeast as an example, Southeastern households have the lowest median income in the country, which likely contributes to higher energy burdens. But in terms of energy prices, the Southeast, along with the Midwest and Northwest regions, have the lowest electricity prices, but at the same time, the highest burden. This indicates that low electricity and gas prices do not necessarily lead to low bills or affordable energy. Although we do not know the relative efficiency of the housing stock in the Southeast, we do know that Southeastern utilities serving many of the um, cities included in our example, have the lowest investment in energy efficiency programs as compared to other regions. So the point here is that low energy prices may not compensate for the lack of efficiency investments or low incomes. So now on to the solutions. Uh, we'll walk through some policies here and um, we'll serve as a, as a nice segue into Rachel's presentation. Reducing the impact of high energy burden, burden has been a long-standing policy goal at the local, state, and national levels. Policy has focused on three main interventions, bill payment assistance, weatherization, and utility-funded efficiency programs. Bill assistance provides immediate relief to qualifying households that suffer from high energy burden. We usually know this in the form of the low-income home energy assistance program, LIHEAP, and also utility low-income bill assistance program. Weatherization provides cost-effective energy efficiency upgrades to qualifying households and typically focuses on upgrades to the building envelope. We usually, this is usually delivered by community action agencies and funded through the federal government's weatherization assistance program. And lastly, there's energy efficiency. Energy efficiency provides upgrades and measures to reduce energy use in households, which can include a variety of upgrades um, to building envelopes, um, also building systems, appliance upgrades, and behavior and education programs. Sometimes efficiency programs are run in tandem with local or statewide weatherization efforts using similar channels to reach customers. Again, Rachel will go in much greater detail about utility programs in just a little bit. But today I want to focus on energy efficiency as an underutilized strategy for addressing energy affordability for the long term. Increased investment, expanded reach of programs, and improved design can better complement um, can, can ensure that efficiency better complements bill assistance and weatherization programs. So why efficiency? Um, we focus on efficiency because it offers multiple benefits to low-income households. Um, maybe the most obvious for, for many of you is lower monthly, monthly bills, which allow families to keep more of their income and spend more of that in the local economy. They'll be less stressed and have to make less trade-offs between important necessities like energy and food. Also, when low-income households have energy efficiency improvements, they've been linked to improved health and safety, which could mean less trips to hospitals due to asthma attacks, um, and also increased property value and lower costs to maintain the home. Renters have also been shown to um, express higher satisfaction and less turnover when efficiency investments are in place. These investments can also lead to more local jobs created through energy and efficiency installations and quality of life improved for all those involved. And less power uh, also means a cleaner environment and improved public health for all communities, especially for lower income who live, often live closer to power plants. And this could also, um, and has also been found to reduce costs for utilities by decreasing um, the need for new generation capacity and transmission investments. So when developing energy efficiency policies and programs, policymakers and other stakeholders must consider the extent to which these investments will reach the target population, especially those experienced persistent and high energy burdens. And that's really a main takeaway from this report. Um, 
is the, the really diversity of low-income populations, the diversity of groups that experience high energy burdens, and with the intent of that it will inform policy and program design moving forward. Um, individuals and families experience high energy burdens vary in very important ways, um, as we saw today, by ownership, income, building type, race and ethnicity, energy intensity, and language is spoken. Therefore, programs and policies should be designed and targeted and implemented with the goal of reaching a wide variety of households facing high energy burdens. Based on our research experience and findings and other reports, we suggest the following strategies for improving energy efficiency in low-income communities. Improving and expanding low-income programs, and this is exactly what Rachel will be talking about today. Collecting, tra tracking, and reporting demographic data on program participation. Strengthening policy levers and more effectively leveraging existing programs. And lastly, utilizing the Clean Power Plan to, private, to prioritize investment in low-income energy efficiency. Again, I, I have said this a few times now, but every city is unique. And policy, policymakers and stakeholders should examine their communities to determine which of the policy recommendations would be most effective um, based on what's already in place and what will, ha what will have the most impact or, or reach. For instance, does your city's utility or local government provide low-income programs for its residents? How can these programs be expanded or improved? Are local utilities tracking key demographics of who their programs serve? Based on these answers to these questions, policymakers and regulators can work with utilities to improve the design and delivery of programs so they are reaching the most overburdened households. State and local governments can also set policy directives that support utility energy efficiency with, um, with separate goals for delivering these programs to low-income households. In some states, um, some states will have lower income goals for both savings or spending um, for ratepayer funds for efficiency programs. For instance, out of the 25 states with statewide energy efficiency requirements, only a few have low income goals. Many states are also in the midst of planning for EPA's Clean Power Plan, which is also the, the focus of today's uh, conversation. States can prioritize energy efficiency programs in their plans to comply with the Clean Power Plan to limit emissions and could also opt into the Clean Energy Incentive Program. This, off this offers early credit for efficiency projects in low-income communities due to, during the two years prior to the start of the compliance period. So together, these policies all aim to reach the households that are currently underserved, and enacting any combination of these policies would be a great first step for many communities. So just some final thoughts before I pass this over to Rachel. Um, we found that overwhelming majority of low income and households of color in major US cities experienced higher energy burdens when compared to average households in the same city. These households may experience many negative long-term effects on their health and well-being. These families are also at greater risk of respiratory diseases and increased stress, and they can experience increased economic hardship and difficulty in moving out of poverty. We encourage cities and other stakeholders to use the data from this report and the recommendations as they work to address high energy burdens in their communities. Each community is unique, and local stakeholders and government should determine which policies and programs are best for their community. Finally, it's important to note that while we recognize energy efficiency as an important strategy for alleviating high energy burdens, we realize there's still a long way to go to ensure an equitable distribution of energy cost for all U.S. families. Hey, great. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was a really interesting presentation. And we have a few uh, clarifying questions. A lot of questions came through, more substantive, substantive ones. Uh, but I'm going to ask Lauren, I'm going to ask you to clarify two things right now before we get to Rachel's presentation. Um, the first, uh, the comment is, I saw that St. Louis was in the range of 4 to 5 percent for energy burdens. To clarify, does this mean that households in St. Louis spent 4 to 5 percent on their energy burdens? Sure. And so I don't have the city-specific numbers in front of me, so I'm happy to connect with you offline if you want to talk more, more about St. Louis in general. But it looks like you're taking the median uh, household energy burden for St. Louis, which would mean that um, again, that's a median number, meaning that 50% of households are above, pay more than 4.4 or 4, or 5% 4, 
of their energy, um, of their income on energy costs. Again, you might want to look at specific groups in St. Louis, which I expect to have much higher percentages than just the median. And then, um, okay, then I think the rest will, will save till the end here. All right, great, thank you. And next we will have Rachel presenting. And take it away, Rachel. All right, thanks. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today um, draws a lot from a report that we released a few months ago um, called Building Better Energy Efficiency Programs for Low-Income Households. In this report, uh, we focus on ratepayer-funded low-income energy efficiency programs that are targeting primarily single-family homes. So that's kind of one piece of the larger picture of programs that Lauren, uh, that Lauren just gave you. Um, one thing to note here is about a quarter of households below the poverty line live in multifamily buildings. So multifamily programs are also a really important part of addressing low-income communities and low-income households. Um, but that's not exactly what we focused on in this, in this report. All right, so there are a number of questions relevant to reaching low-income households and meeting their energy needs that we kind of set out to answer and present in this report. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to just touch briefly on many of these questions listed. Uh, you can kind of think of it as a teaser for the full report. What I want to do is spend most of the time getting into the meat of how utilities are successfully reaching and serving low-income households and then discuss some opportunities we found for getting greater electricity savings for these customers by incorporating technologies and measures that are currently underutilized in programs. All right, so understanding how appliance equipment and use characteristics differ among the population you're trying to serve is really important to designing programs that, first of all, people can actually access and that best address the energy issues in these homes and ultimately get us to the highest safety programs. So Lauren talked a lot about this. I won't go into too much detail, but even though uh, low-income households have lower annual household energy expenditures, the cost per square foot of house um, is higher. Um, so data on appliances and equipment in low-income households um, from the Energy Information Administration's Residential Energy Consumption Survey back this up. Um, Low-income households are more likely to have appliances that are older, secondhand, um, and less likely to have Energy Star labeled products. So looking at refrigerators, for example, about 29% of low-income households have an Energy Star rated efficient refrigerator as compared to about 45% of the general population. Um, Low-income households are also more likely to use electricity for their space heating and water heating needs, which, while there are a few exceptions, is generally more costly and energy intensive than other ways of heating um, for space and water. All right. So this is kind of a picture of, you know, one, the larger effort to address the energy needs of low-income households. Um, I think this is important to look at in the context of ratepayer funded energy efficiency programs um, to think about where there's overlap, where there are gaps, and where there's opportunity for collaboration. So this figure shows financial support for low income energy needs. It captures a total of about $7.8 billion of spending. This is not comprehensive, but it's meant to give you a general sense of what's out there. So about 81% of the pie, that peach color, um, goes to bill payment assistance, with about equal parts supported by the federal LIHEAP program, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, and, uh, and rate payer funded dollars. So important to note here um, that there's a real need for both bill assistance to help households that are in immediate need and struggling with their utility bills and for energy efficiency programs that more permanently help reduce energy use and address the energy burden that, that Lauren talked so much about. Um, the area that I'm focusing on today is where that red arrow points, 
the ratepayer fund and energy efficiency piece. In 2014, that accounted for about $360 million of spending, um, which is about 18% of the total ratepayer dollars spent on residential energy efficiency. So in contrast, um, you know, 18% of those of the residential dollars um, going to try to serve about a third of the population uh, that's considered low income. So definitely room, room to grow. All right, so most ratepayer funded low income efforts are either whole building retrofit programs um, that either operate on their own or in conjunction with the state and federally funded weatherization program efforts. Um, and then low-cost measure installations, which are often referred to as direct install programs of low-cost measures like lighting, shower heads, uh, faucet aerators, etc. Both of these approaches are usually offered for low-income customers uh, at no cost. Um, this graph shows the, let's see, so one thing to note here is how much this differs from the, from standard residential programs, where most electric savings result from prescriptive rebate programs. We'll see that big orange bar towards the right. So hold on to that for a minute as we look at this next graph. Um, this depicts the cost of saved energy by residential program type. So basically what this means is that for each different type of program, how much it costs program administrators and program participants to save one unit of energy, one kilowatt hour. The majority of residential programs, uh, where we saw most savings coming from the last graph, are in these first two categories, the lowest cost categories, um, which are product rebates for things like appliances and consumer electronics and prescriptive rebates for things like HVAC systems and water heaters. While low-income households aren't excluded from participating in these programs by any means, they're not as likely to participate. Um, they, these programs require an upfront consumer investment, customer investment to leverage uh, the utility rebate and the associated savings that low-income households just often aren't in a position to make. Um, you know, additionally, these programs aren't always targeted towards low-income households um, because there's this perception that they either aren't as likely to participate or aren't able. All right. So I'm going to get into now what are some of the best practices that we found for running programs that are actually reaching low-income households and addressing their energy needs. Um, in this report, we detail the following recommendations, uh, these eight recommendations for building better low-income programs with examples of current utility programs that are using the strategies and that they're working well for. I'm going to highlight just a few of these recommendations um, so that we have some time at the end to dig into this number eight, um, increasing electric savings through high efficiency products and equipment. Next slide, please. All right, so first recommendation here. Many weatherization and whole building programs have traditionally focused on the building shell, um, addressing insulation and air sealing primarily, and sometimes the heating system as the primary measures that are upgraded. The general rule of thumb in, in the retrofit community is you know, to start with insulation and air sealing because they provide the most cost-effective savings. Um, for many existing residential buildings, this definitely still holds true, um, but expanding the scope of measures that can be installed during a weatherization program or a whole building program is advantageous for a few different reasons. So first, Looking at these, these two graphs here, um, one depicting energy end uses in 90, 1993 in the 90s, uh, and then one in 2009. The, um, in the average US household, 
on the whole, heating and cooling no longer accounts for the majority of energy that's used. Um, this is changing primarily as more appliances and electronic loads become common um, and just much more uh, a part of what people are using in their homes. Um, this is also really important to consider in places where space condition loads are not the dominant source of energy use and have not been for a long time. Um, one example is the Energy Savings Assistance Program that's offered by the California Investor and Utilities. They include a range of different measures in addition to traditional weatherization measures, um, including things like lighting and refrigerators, so that when an audit is done or an assessment is done on a house, um, you know, the, the person that's doing the assessment has kind of a, a broader scope of measures to choose from to adequately address, you know, what's really going on in that, in that person's house. Next slide, please. All right, next, so coordinating with other organizations that are serving low-income households. So there are a number of opportunities in this area. Um, this is, I think, particularly important to consider in the context of ramping up efforts for the Clean Power Plan. Um, you know, what are organizations doing to address low-income energy needs already in your community, and how can these efforts be scaled up? First, many utilities do this, and I think, you know, there's still opportunity for, um, do, for beginning it in certain places. Um, utilities can align their programs with existing state and federally funded weatherization efforts. And this works really well in places where there's, you know, a well-established um, network of providers for a, a state weatherization program. Um, one example is Consumers Energy in Michigan. They run an income qualified energy assistance program that is continually coordinating with local agencies that provide the state and federally funded weatherization. Um, they coordinate measures, try to stay consistent with what's being offered in the state program. Um, this approach has been advantageous for both utilities and weatherization agencies in this case, as kind of a few years ago there was you know, a big spike in spending for federal weatherization. Now those budgets have declined and agencies are kind of struggling to meet customer demand for energy efficiency services with that lower budget. Um, the next one here, add-on measures. So what I mean by this is you know, utilities can supplement the state weatherization program by adding on measures that kind of go beyond what would otherwise, otherwise be included in the state or federally funded program. Um, similar to kind of what I just talked about, but you know, less full-on coordination of the program type. Um, one example of this in is in um, Vermont, where Efficiency Vermont supplement, supplements their state's weatherization program with refrigerators, clothes washers, uh, lighting, ventilation fans, smart power strips. Um, so let's see, the last one here, um, delivering measures through innovative channels. A few different interesting things that have been happening. Um, first, you know, using kind of where low-income households are already going for services to think about where efficiency measures can fit in. Um, in a number of different places, in Vermont, Pennsylvania, to name two, um, food banks, uh, community events, mobile food markets, places that people are already going to get, to get services, um, have been used to distribute uh, efficient light bulbs. Um, the other, op the other uh, example here is one from Efficiency Vermont where the uh, program coordinated with the Women, Infants, and Children program, um, which uh, addresses kind of food um, security issues with a refrigerator replacement program. So, you know, the food that families were buying could have a place where, you know, it could stay fresh longer in a refrigerator that's working well, using less energy, et cetera. All right. Oops, I think we skipped one. 
There we go. Okay. So it's not uncommon for programs targeting low-income homes with whole building improvements to find some type of health, safety, moisture, durability, or structural issue that requires repair before you can really do a good job with an efficiency improvement. Um, major issues can prevent households from receiving energy efficiency measures altogether, while minor issues can really add up you know, the cost of, of that energy efficiency project. So a few things that utilities uh, and programs have done to address this for minor improvements, planning for the fact that there's likely going to be something that you need to address. Um, so a number of programs have, you know, a certain limit, um, either a percentage or a dollar amount that they can spend on health and safety issues in the house so that they don't have to kind of lose that customer after they've invested so much time getting them into the program, getting them ready to do the work. And then, um, you know, there's some issue that's uncovered. Um, for major improvements, connecting homeowners to other services in, in the region. Um, some utilities have done a really great job of kind of getting to know what kind of other resources there are for their customers to address some of the bigger issues and then connecting customers to, to these organizations and then following back up with them after the improvement has been made to make sure that they can still go through the efficiency program. All right. So real quick, just to bring it back to this slide, um, you know, we know most of the savings come from weatherization, whole building measures, um, and direct install measures. Some of the real opportunities are um, improve, improving appliance efficiency. So we know older, less efficient appliances. We also know from some interesting research that um, came out recently that residential product programs are not adequately reaching low-income households. Um, so thinking about ways to design appliance programs that can address the specific needs of low-income customers, either through tailoring eligible product lists so that they're um, still high efficiency products, but maybe at more moderate price points is, is one opportunity. And to illustrate what I mean by this, um, this figure shows the range of energy use and price points for refrigerators that are between 17 and 20 cubic feet in a number of different product categories, categories that are on the market, you'll see that there's a big um, range in price, um, in energy use, and what we think is that um, there are opportunities for programs to incorporate um, top freezer refrigerator models that have lower absolute energy use and lower retail prices into low-income programs so that they're more accessible than some of the, the higher cost. And I'm just going to go through this real quick because we're running a bit short on time, but a few of the other opportunities um, for high efficiency products include um, clothes washers, electric heat pump water heaters, and ductless mini split heat pumps. Uh, we see some places where these ultra high efficiency products are being incorporated into program offerings. Uh, but there's definitely room for growth here. So a few strategies and uh, thoughts about how, how this might work. Um, one is kind of the, the add-on approach that I mentioned earlier, adding on to existing state weatherization efforts or existing other program efforts um, to include ultra-high efficiency products. Also, integrating high efficiency equipment into projects that other organizations serving low-income programs uh, customers are already doing. So one example here is in Michigan, uh, Consumers Energy developed an online tool that they call the Community Partnership Portal. It's basically a tool for nonprofit organizations to reserve funds to offset the cost of buying a higher efficiency measure for their low-income housing projects. Um, so, you know, for example, an organization like Habitat for Humanity, if they're 
doing a rehab. They could go here, get money to um, actually you know, buy, buy a much higher efficiency unit for that project that they're doing. And last, um, yeah, kind of an approach that's not really common uh, anymore in the US, uh, equipment rental and leasing. Um, Green Mountain Power in Vermont has been doing this for high efficiency water heaters and ductless heat pump systems for their customers, for all customers, not just low income. So a few kind of broad takeaways from this. There's a lot of opportunity to expand low income uh, programs um, and the Clean Power Plan really serves a good point to start some of those conversations about coordinating between organizations uh, within your state, within your community. Um, which speaks to that second point there, looking for partnerships with organizations that are already working to serve low-income households. Um, last, you know, this idea of increasing the focus on electricity plug loads um, to help programs and customers reap really big savings. And that's it. The full report is available at the link here. Um, I think Cassandra has it at the end of this presentation, too. But I will let her take over now. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you to both Rachel and Lauren. Those were um, great overviews of some recent research that they completed and hopefully gave you a nice picture of both why uh, low-income energy efficiency is important and then how to execute it, um, particularly at uh, the utility, uh, the ratepayer funded level. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, you know, what, what this means for the Clean Power Plan, or really what the Clean Power Plan means um, for low-income efficiency and how it can just be one more opportunity um, uh, you know, for, in terms of states to be able to look at um, low-income energy efficiency uh, for all of these multiple reasons that we've just been hearing about. It's just one more reason that um, states can, can focus on these opportunities. So I'm sure many of you on the line already know, um, but just to get everyone on the same page, uh, EPA uh, put forth the Clean Power Plan, and it's a regulation that, that sets state uh, limits uh, on um, uh, existing uh, power plants, uh, fossil fuel power plants, uh, that limits CO2 emissions. And uh, also I should say, as most of you also are probably aware, there's currently a stay on the rule um, that has been issued by the Supreme Court. However, many states are continuing to move forward with planning um, for strategies to limit carbon emissions, and energy efficiency is a least cost strategy for doing so. Um, and it's also recognized as uh, a least cost strategy for uh, clean power plant compliance in general. Um, you know, reducing emissions through efficiency um, you know, can be used for compliance, and particularly uh, states can focus on low income customers. And you know, getting into the multiple benefits, we heard from Lauren's presentation that um, efficiency, it goes beyond emissions reduction. Um, states can use this strategy for, for its many benefits, including reducing monthly bills for customers who have high energy burdens, improving the housing stock, um, better health and safety and lower maintenance costs, creating opportunities for local economic development through job creation, uh, and increased property values, and then, of course, reducing pollutants and improving public health. And in, you know, in general, states can establish long-term strategies to benefit these communities most in need. And the Clean Power Plan is a great opportunity for states to either start to consider how they can, how they can do this or continue to move forward and see ways to expand their current opportunities that are available to these communities. So this goes into a little bit more about how do you capture you know, the savings and the benefits from low-income efficiency for compliance. There is significant investment opportunity um, for low-income efficiency throughout compliance. We've heard a lot about, you know, there's this early action program, which I have a slide on, which we can we don't have to spend a lot of time on, because uh, Lauren touched on that a bit. This clean energy incentive program, which is 
an, an opportunity for states to voluntarily um, participate in two years prior to uh, the compliance period starting in 2022. And it, uh, you know, that, that's certainly one way states can, can value low-income efficiency. However, they can also value it throughout the entire compliance period. Um, some key things to keep in mind here is the outreach to stakeholders. Um, Clean Power Plan uh, involves a new level of coordination between utilities, state agencies, energy planners, and generally representatives of the public interest. And uh, in the rule, EPA actually requires uh, the state to engage uh, communities that are vulnerable to climate change. And organizations that serve low-income households can help to engage these constituencies so that their needs are better met through the planning process. Um, you know, but states don't have to start from scratch. Um, some of the key stakeholders uh, to, to get around the table include state regulators, so we're talking about air offices, we're talking about state energy offices, and utility regulators, also the utilities themselves. And then, as you can see listed here, public housing authorities, housing finance agencies, and other affordable housing organizations and low-income energy efficiency program managers can really work with the state to help them to understand what's already happening in the state and how to go about um, capturing the savings from those existing programs and projects that are taking place and to then expand on them uh, uh, in the future. And I should say, too, before I leave this slide too quickly, um, you see the low-income program type here at the bottom. Uh, we heard a lot about the utility-run programs from Rachel's presentation. We also heard about the weatherization assistance program uh, from Lauren. And um, something I don't think has been touched on yet is the energy savings performance contracting. And that can be done with public housing authorities. Um, so that's another way to engage uh, low-income programs for compliance. So I really want to emphasize that you can use, not only use low income efficiency throughout the compliance period, but you can use it with any type of compliance plan that a state chooses. And of course we're talking about rate or mass. For rate, um, any low income efficiency that's installed on or after January 1st of 2013, and the key here, that is still achieving savings in 2022, which is the compliance, uh, start of compliance in the rules currently, um, can earn what's called emission rate credits, or ERCs. And that's one emission rate credit is equal to one megawatt hour. And, and utilities or uh, uh, electric generating unit owners uh, then have to acquire these ERCs in order to show that they're complying with their emission targets. So also in a mass-based setting, um, you know, there's not really a, a, a date that's involved like there is on the rate-based side, but really any reductions during the compliance period uh, can count uh, toward lowering a state's overall um, emissions uh, to, to get to the, the cap that they're trying to get to on the mass-based side. And you know, states can go further and directly allocate um, a portion of their allowances which is the, um, the tradable commodity on the mass-based side, just as ERCs are on the rate-based side. So states can take those allowances, give them straight to low-income efficiency providers who can then turn around and sell those to the EGU, own, EGU owners who need those uh, for compliance, need those allowances for compliance. So that's a way to generate um, uh, some money to go toward these projects. And then also states can auction allowances and then defer those, that revenue back to low-income providers. Here, Clean Energy Incentive Program, most of you are probably aware, so I'm not going to go into these details, um, but it's just, you know, there's, it's, there's an opportunity to um, specifically for energy efficiency implemented in low-income communities in that there's a two-to-one benefit uh, for states that participate in this voluntary early action program. But I think, you know, one of the keys here as far as what's happening currently with this program given um, the stay of the rule is that, uh, you know, stakeholders are waiting for additional program guidance from EPA currently. So a lot of the details of this program are kind of to be determined at this point, except for a lot of the things you see on the slide here. Um, but things like, you know, what is the definition of low-income energy efficiency um, projects? 
um, you know, and um, how do you go about converting megawatt hours to CO2 emissions. So there are a lot of uh, nitty-gritty details that are still, um, you know, need to be ironed out with this program, but um, it, it, it does offer a, a nice additional opportunity in the clean power plant for low income efficiency. And so lastly, just some key takeaways here. Um, you know, by working together to include low income efficiency in state compliance plans, air offices working together with the affordable housing community will really create a sense of permanence for these programs and investments. And create momentum to improve existing programs or even open the door for additional funding um, from compliance to go towards these uh, types of projects. Um, and, it, you know, the Clean Power Plan creates an opportunities for states to consider how they can set up long-term strategies to benefit the communities that are most in need in their state. And it really, you know, creates a, an opportunity to do that. You can see here listed at the bottom details for how to get involved in state compliance planning. Um, this was a, a, a primer, a, a white paper of sorts, a brief that was done um, by Lauren Roth here, was one of the authors, along with the Energy Efficiency for All Coalition and other organizations. And so I have the link here because it really lays out steps for how to engage in your state's compliance planning process. And I really urge you to go and look through that. And of course, these slides will be available at the end of the presentation, so you can go through and find that link. And here are additional resources. Uh, the top two links there are the reports that we heard from, from Lauren and Rachel today. And also I put on here a forthcoming uh, white paper that we have coming out um, in just a few weeks, I think in the next week or two. It's called Best Practices in Developing Low-Income Energy Efficiency Programs and Considerations for Clean Power Plant Compliance. That really lays out, it makes a lot of the connections from, um, you know, how you want to do low-income, who do you have to get involved, and what are the considerations and EM and V considerations you need to think about when you're then uh, looking toward using these types of programs for compliance. So stay tuned for that. And also uh, this primer again, and then at the bottom you can see our Clean Power Plan page that has all sorts of resources for including efficiency in the Clean Power Plan. So here, quick plug for our upcoming webinar, Complying with the Clean Power Plan, an opportunity for the industrial sector. So this webinar is taking place next month, and we will be hearing from Megan Kelly, a senior research analyst here at ACEEE uh, in our industry program. And she's going to discuss the value of industrial efficiency programs and opportunities to achieve greater program participation. And we'll also, of course, tie that back into how those uh, opportunities can be used for the Clean Power Plan. And now we are going to get into your many questions. I know we there was a lot to say. Uh, it looks like we're done at 2 o'clock here, um, but we're not. We want to make some more time for people to get their questions answered. And I should say, you know, if you have to drop off the line now, um, this webinar is being recorded so you can access um, the questions and hear the answers that our presenters are going to give, um, you know, later on. Um, but for any of you who have a really pressing question that we don't get to, please feel free to reach out to us. You can see um, the contact information listed on this slide here. So we're going to dive right in. And for any of you who have questions that you're thinking of in the next 10 or so minutes um, that we have here to go through questions, please type them in, but again, I urge you to contact us directly through email as well. All right, so um, first for Lauren, a um, few maybe quicker questions. Uh, do you weather normalize this data, and also what sources do you use for the energy burden data? Uh, it's difficult getting this information from utilities, and uh, you know your, your results have been impressive. So, how did you do it? Sure. So um, that's a great question, and I, I should have started by saying that very few studies have looked at energy costs at the more granular level that granular granular level that we have. Um, we pulled our data from the American Housing Survey, which is put out by the is conducted by Census and um, administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the unit of analysis there is households. And um, we, they had all the variables we were looking for. They did not have water costs, and that was another question we got. Um, why did we leave out water costs? Um, 
we, we weren't able to include that in the sample. And um, same thing with transportation. It does have transportation costs as a bit beyond the scope of this project, but this is very much a first kind of its analysis. Um, we're the first really to use this data set to analyze energy burdens um, in the way we did across the U.S. Um, so just some there, there's a, so it's a, both a factor of um, data limitations and also the scope of our analysis. But then to answer your question about weather, we, we didn't weather normalize. And you know, we put out a lot of numbers, and although we cautioned about comparing across cities, there certainly was a tendency to do so among the, the audience. Um, and the readers. So that, that's not a surprise at all. But we do encourage more so that cities are compared, um, a, that cities are, that you're comparing, you know, African Americans in St. Louis or Latinos in San Jose against their own city, the average city household um, within the city they reside, versus necessarily ca comparing across because, you know, on average, one city may have a much higher energy burden, which then you see, you know, the low income households having extremely higher energy burden may be compared to a city with a much lower average burden. So um, you have to be very careful in, in comparing across cities. And instead, this report is, is most useful in the context of comparing groups within cities to their city median average. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, we also got a lot of questions really asking about data and city-specific um, city-specific questions, so please feel free to reach out to me, and I can make sure those are answered. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Now we have a question for Rachel. Uh, the amount that's spent on bill assistance is striking. How can I find out or understand what the percentage of ratepayer-funded bill assistance is in, in my own community, wherever that community may be? So the resource that we used for this information is uh, called the LIHEAP Clearinghouse. Um, it's a website you can go to. Um, they list the spending on um, ratepayer funded bill assistance as well as the federal LIHEAP budget for bill assistance by state. Um, I haven't seen anything that gets down to the individual community level. Um, but if you want to at least narrow it down to the state that you're located in, that's a good place to start. So that's the LIHEAP Clearinghouse. Great. Thank you. And um, the next one, um, we'll just answer generally. I'll, I should preface by saying we, so it's about job creation and how, how are jobs created by energy efficiency. So I'll put that to, to Lauren, um, or specifically how are local jobs created, but I should also say that we have um, uh, an economist here on staff that does all of our jobs analysis, and we have a lot of information about job creation from efficiency on our website that you can look to further. But Lauren, do you want to sure. talk briefly about that? Sure. And again, I'll talk more in a general sense, but when we talk about local job creation through energy efficiency, we're essentially talking about um, the effect of greater investments in efficiency, whether it be policies that um, are aimed at ramping up efficiency investments in this throughout a state or in a particular community, or utility programs that are really incentivizing um, efficiency in the community. From that, you will see, and the same goes with if it's um, locally funded projects or state funded projects, you'll see a, a greater local demand for energy efficiency jobs. So there you'll see job creation driven through policies and programs, um, really anything that is, is aimed at increasing increasing in locally based investments in efficiency. Also, um, you know, as businesses, manufacturing, industrial um, companies invest in efficiency, um, that money that reduces their bottom line and more money is, goes back into the company, um, which we also hope will foster um, job creation. So those are kind of two key ways in which we, we assess local job creation or we think about local job creation um, as a result of efficiency. OK, great. Thank you. And let's see. Um, so this one's for Rachel. Um, on, the, uh, on one of your graphs of ratepayer funded efficiency, um, w in which category would innovative finance programs like on-bill um, financing fall? And I don't know if you, you want us to go back to one of your slides or not. That. No, that's okay. Um, that is a good question, and that's something that we did not capture um, in this report. 
And I think that it's an emerging area that we're really interested in keeping a close eye on. Um, I know that there have been some really interesting, innovative approaches in the southeast with on-bill financing programs. Um, I think that's, that's something that we'll kind of keep our eyes open for more um, and could be a really good way for um, low-income customers who can't afford this work up front to pay for some of these improvements. Okay, great. Thank you. So we also got several questions about split incentive for owners and renters. Um, and so, Lauren, to you, why should owners of multifamily invest, multifamily um, buildings invest in energy efficiency? Sure. So um, I'll take a stab at answering this, and if, if Rachel wants to add on, she can as well. But the, the question there is, why would a multifamily building owner want to invest in efficiency um, throughout their building if tenants are going to benefit through utility savings? Right, so, so that's the main question at the heart of the split incentive issue. And, um, you know, there's two points I want to put out. Um, one is the way that um, utility programs are being designed for multifamily customers to encourage both in-unit and whole building system um, upgrades that would benefit both owners and renters, as well as the, the multiple benefits for efficiency for owners that are outside of those direct utility savings. Um, first, Programs are increasingly being designed in the multifamily sector, or I should say leading programs are offering a mix of incentives that encourage both in-unit measures and at the same time whole building systems so that um, programs are comprehensively designed to benefit both um, in-unit and, and whole building uh, upgrades that would result in savings in, in most cases for both the owner and tenant at the same time. Again, you're probably asking, but again, why would they want to invest any money if it's not, you know, free direct install measures in, in units? Why would building owners want to participate in a program? Well, we find, and I think there's really increasing research coming out on this, and I know several are interested in, in documenting this more, but there is preliminary research out that suggests multiple benefits um, for owners beyond just those in-unit utility savings, like gr greater comfort for tenants. Um, tenants see reductions in their bills. Tenants are more satisfied after efficiency is in place. Greater efficiency takes place. Um, what that helps the owner's bottom line. Um, they, you see decreased uh, vacancy rates, which certainly helps owners' better bottom line. And you also see increased property values. Um, so those are ways that um, you know we here see split incentive might be a challenge at times, but it really shouldn't be a barrier. Um, to efficiency. There's a lot of ways owners benefit by in improving tenant spaces, reducing energy waste, um, and, and utilities are really beginning to design programs so that a mix of in-unit and whole building measures are available. Okay, great. Thank you. We have another question that came through, a clarifying question. What is an EGU, no, excuse me, EGU owner? And I should have been much more explicit when I was referring to that. An EGU owner is, an, it's EGU stands for Electric Generating Unit, and that is just an acronym that EPA uses in their Clean Power Plan rule to note anyone who is an owner of an, effect, of a, of an affected uh, uh, electric um, power plant, uh, a unit that is covered by uh, the rule and therefore has limits, emission limits that it needs to adhere by. So another question that I'll put to Rachel is, what percentage of home energy assessments for low-income customers result in health and safety issues? That's a good question. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, but one thing that I have found helpful in kind of thinking through um, you know, what some of the major issues are and how they've been addressed is an evaluation that was done um, of the weatherization assistance program um, in 2015. Um, and I can follow up with you to share that. But basically what they looked at is um, how many houses were deferred from the program, whether house, households that were deferred ever made it back to receive efficiency services, meaning that they had whatever major health or safety or um, you know other issue dealt with so that they could get efficiency measures installed. 
um, that's that's kind of I think a good good resource to start. Um, we are very interested in kind of how much utilities are having to spend on health and safety um, for these homes. Some of them have the spending limit kind of per household that they serve. Others, it's like an overall um, you know limit on the on what they spend for the program itself. Um, so I think there's a bit more digging that can be done there to see whether those um, those spending limits are maxed out in most homes, whether they don't really need to be used, um, that sort of thing. But, yeah, it's a good question and something that we, we don't have great information on, um, but it's definitely a big, a big piece of the, the puzzle for um, doing improvements for low income. Okay, thank you. And we'll do one more for Lauren and one more for Rachel. So there are a lot of questions here. I don't want to keep you all, though. For, for too much longer, we're already over time. However, please I urge you to reach out to uh, speakers directly to get your answers, uh, questions answered uh, if you haven't yet. So lastly for Lauren, are you seeing a difference between rural and urban households with regard to uh, low-income household energy burden? Well, for our study, we were actually unable to look at rural household energy Burdens. Um, this was simply due to a lack of data on rural households. Um, the survey that we used over samples urban areas, so that's how we were able to look at those large cities. Um, we do know that rural households, um, poverty is a major issue for rural, ha rural households as well as energy costs. Um, but that's all to say that um, future research really needs to look deeper um, into what groups and, and to get into a little bit more of some of the demographics that we got into, how ownership, how housing tenure versus ownership versus renting affects these burdens in rural areas, I think is, is somewhat still an unanswered question. Okay, thank you. And um, for Rachel, last question that we'll get to today. Are there good examples of how energy efficiency programs have addressed walkway issues like mold or asbestos? Okay, so in most of the cases um, that I've seen where um, where programs have been able to actually go back um, after after the customer's been deferred for like a major issue like that, um, there is kind of hand-holding of, of that customer by the utility program to make sure that they, um, that they can get the work done on the house that they need um, by another community organization, um, you know, when the, when the efficiency program just does not have the bandwidth to do something about it, um, you know, it's not in their scope. Um, they shouldn't necessarily be required to. Um, do a big mold remediation or something like that. But um, yeah, the, the case that I've seen um, is, let's see, a Connecticut utility, um, United Illuminating. Um, if you want to follow up with me, I can I point you to the resource that I'm thinking of. But um, they're an example um, where they've done a really good job kind of getting to know what resources exist in their local community that they can connect households too that have major issues and then kind of keep in touch with them so that they can get back into the efficiency program and actually get that work done. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you again both to Lauren and Rachel for these great presentations. I hope you all found this to be useful and I know we didn't get to everyone's question. However, there were a lot of um, more detailed questions and if you want to follow up, please follow up directly. Also, though, we encourage you to go through and read the reports, and you might find um, the information you're looking for in those as well. Um, so please, uh, you know, continue to join our webinar series, and we thank you for joining today, and we hope to see you on the next webinar.